Hi everyone, in this video I'll be doing Advent of Code 2021, Day 16. I'll be doing the puzzles, then explaining them afterwards. So today's puzzles were some of the most fun this year, in my opinion, but also some of the trickiest. These also remind me of what happened in 2019 with IntCode, where people wrote all sorts of interpreters for IntCode, and it became a whole sort of meme for Advent of Code. I think this year, Eric might be trying to throw back to that and might do a few more puzzles that use this protocol, the Buoyancy Interchange Transmission System. Um, and I think people will be posting memes on the subreddit already. Um, that's my take, that's my suspicion. Maybe this won't happen. I hope it happens though, because my code is... I spent a lot of time making this efficient. So parts one and part two, I use different solutions different approaches. Part one is far slower than part two, uh, my solutions at least. So if you want to skip forward to part two where I do the efficient way, feel free to do that. Timestamp will be in the description. But if you just want to hear how I did it, how I did the whole thing, then I'll explain part one and part two. All right, so part one, as we leave the cave and reach open waters, we receive a transmission from the elves back on the ship. They send it in the buoyancy interchange transmission system a method of packing numeric expressions into a binary sequence. Our computer has saved the transmission in hexadecimal. So hexadecimal is like base 16. It's like base 2, except every four bits are compressed into one hexadecimal character. It's just base 16. Very simple. Hopefully you've heard of it before. It's quite nice. So our first job is to decode the hexadecimal into binary. And then we have to do a bit of processing. So... Hopefully you've read the entire puzzle. I'll just summarize it real quick because there is a lot to read here. Basically, this input is in the form of packets, and each packet represents a single number. What we have to do is process the entire packet. Um, but packets can contain other packets inside of them, which makes this a lot more complicated, and we have to use recursion for that. So basically, there's two kinds of packets in part one. There's literal packets, which literally represent a number, and operator packets, which contain separable packets inside them, which can be operator packets or literal packets. And there's two kinds of operator packets. There's um, ones that express their uh, the length of their subpackets in bits, and ones that represent the number of subpackets sub that are inside. So this is all very complicated. There's a lot of details. There's a lot of examples, which was very helpful. Um, but if you haven't read the puzzle already, highly suggest you read it because there's lots of info in there. So I'm going to assume you know what's going on in this puzzle. Let's go through my code. So part one, I wrote a function that passes it, that processes a single packet. And, and it takes in a string, which is the entire packet. Actually, this packet contain other, can contain multiple packets. So packet is kind of misleading. It could be a combination of several or just one as well as a auxiliary parameter, which is the number of packets that remain inside this packet that we have to parse. This auxiliary variable um, parameter was added a bit later when I was processing the operator packets that include a length that describes the number of subpackets inside. So you, c you can ignore sort of this auxiliary uh, parameter for now. Uh, I'll just go through the important bit. So first of all, we parse the version and the ID, which we can do simply by taking those three bits and turning them into integers using whatever base conversion, um, I mean string to integer function is in your favorite language. Um, if the type ID is four, then we have to process a literal packet by simply looping through and taking groups of five and then keep going until we reach a group of five that starts with zero because that's the last packet and then we just append that to a string, and then we convert that string into base2. There are more efficient ways of doing this, but they're a bit more complicated, and I just thought using strings was simplest, and it's fast enough, so might as well. Um, I should note that our goal for part one is to determine all the version numbers of all the packets, because every packet has a version number. So if we're processing a version number, uh, sorry, if we're processing a literal packet, then we simply add on the version number we don't we don't actually care about any of the stuff in here we can we can just discard that um, plus the rest of the string that is the packets because remember the input to this function is possibly several packets so we need to take our current literal packet and add on the version numbers of all the rest otherwise if it's not a literal packet if its type identifier is not four then we 
compute whether it is a packet that has like um, number of bits in the sub packets or number of packets in the sub packets. I'm going to use 15 operators and 11 operators uh, to distinguish between these two types because it's just easier to say. So 15 types have 15 bits describing how many bits are inside the sub packets and 11 types describe how many sub packets are inside. Although I, I, I do wonder why they have 15 bits describing how many bits are inside the um, sub packets because 15 bits, that's like a lot. That can describe up to 2 to the 15, which is a huge number, and we can't possibly have that many bits inside our input, which is more evidence to suggest that Eric will include more of this bits protocol uh, stuff in future days, because maybe these 15 bits are necessary. Uh, and then we have, uh, yeah, basically what we do here is if we are given the range of sub packets, so we know how many bits are remaining in the sub packets in this operator packet, then we simply take that, we cut out that string, and we parse it. Um, and then if we're doing a 11 type, then we simply go through the rest of the packet because that has sub packets as well as possible future packets, so we don't have to do any of this stuff. Um, and this is where the auxiliary parameter comes in. We set our count to the number of sub packets, and every time we return in this function, we decrement that count by one. Also note the base cases up here. If the packet is empty or it's all zeros, then we return zero because the sum of version numbers is, is non-existent. Um, and if we've reached the end of a packet count, sorry, if we've reached the end of a 11 type, then we simply continue on and reset the count. Actually, now that I think about it, this is probably unnecessary. Anyways, um, that's our parsing function for parsing a single packet that uses recursion to parse sub packets within. Also, we should note that when we're parsing this hexadecimal string and converting it to binary, there may be some zeros missing at the beginning, so we do have to pad in those zeros to make the entire binary string a multiple of four in length, because every hexadecimal character is four, every hexadecimal, di every hexadecimal digit is four bits. All right, so that was part one of today's puzzles, and I think my solution was not the most efficient, so if you just want to know how I did it, this is the way I did it. It was quite naive, kind of hard to follow, so I would not suggest using this method for future days if you had to do the bits protocol. Now for part two, I actually made a good function that parses efficiently and is easier to read. So whereas for part one, I used a function that required lots of extra memory by computing lots of substrings, part two does not do that. Instead, it just keeps track of the original giant packet, and we have two param three parameters. We have i, which is where we should start parsing a packet. So this function um, is for like parsing, a, parsing the big packet at a given index. So i is where the given packet starts. J is where the given packet should end if there is an ending at all. And this is for those 15 types, those op op operation packets. I forgot the word. An operator packet, yes. Those operator packets that have a length ID of 15 bits. Um, for those, we need this J parameter to describe when to stop parsing the current sequence of packets. And then we have this rem parameter, which is similar to what I had in part one. It's counting down the number of uh, child packets that we have left if it's an 11-bit type of operator packet. And then what we return from this is two things, because we're working with a string and like sort of iterating through it because we're using these parameters that tell us when to start and end. We have to return the, first of all, the ver value of the current packet. That's obvious. And then we also have to return when the next packet starts so that when we are iterating, we can take advantage of that and know when to leave off for uh, start up for the next packet. So uh, again, base cases, if there are no packets remaining or we've reached the end of our limit for 11 types or 15 types, we simply return none for both of these values to signal that the current sequence of sub packets for an operator packet has ended. Now, um, we also have this, which is just discarding the garbage bits at the end, pretty self-explanatory. Um, we parse our version and type ID as before, except this time we are indexing starting at I. 
Now we do the same thing as before in part one. If it's a literal packet, we just run through it. This should be pretty simple. Um, and then otherwise, it's an operator packet. So we have to keep track of the values of our sub packets within this operator packets. Uh, we also have to keep track of this variable to, like we're supposed to return a value telling us when the next packet starts, the index. Um, so we just initialize that right here and we have to keep track of that. If it's a 15 type, then we compute how many bits are in the sub packets and do all that setup. And then this is where our genius comes in, I guess. We keep track of which index we are currently parsing. So for example, if we're looking at our sub packets, say it starts here as an example, it probably doesn't. Um, then when we finish our first sub packet, it returns and it tells us the value of this, which is like four or something. By the way, this is like totally not accurate because these packets are really long. Um, and it tells us, it also returns another value, which is the index of where we where the next sub packet starts. So we start from there. And then we, you know, compute however much that packet is. Um, and then it points us to the next index for when the next sub packet starts. And we keep going until we reach the end. Um, and when we reach the end, uh, we are pointing to none. So the next index for starting a sub packet is none because we have reached the end of all the sub packets. Once we reach the end of all sub packets, we need to be careful to remove the last element of that because when we're adding all these numbers, we're going to add none at the end when we stop. So we have to make sure to get rid of that. Um, and then we can set our pointer to when to start for like the function that calls from above to the uh, last index that we stopped off at. Um, and now we have the 11 types. These are a little bit simpler. Again, we compute how many sub packets we need. We set our index, we update our index. And again, our genius comes in because uh, when we're calling these child functions, we are doing the auxiliary rem variable, which keeps track of how many packets there are left to process. Actually, now that I think about it, this is probably not a necessary variable. Yeah, no, it was not necessary at all. I just removed it. It works fine. So we parse the parse. Sorry, we parse all the sub packets. And then we have to make sure that the remaining number of sub packets is still positive. And then when we reach the end, when we have uh, found all the sub packets, then we can stop. And again, we need to update this variable that tells us um, when the next sub packet starts for returning to the parent function. After that, the hard work has been done. We are given an operating packet. We can find all of the sub packets inside and we have their values in a nice list. Now what we need to do is do what the puzzle says and we have to use these rules, use the type IDs, which are actually useful now, not just for and not for. We have to do some operations on these values of the sub packets and the key is given here. Um, this function is pretty generic. It just tells us given a type ID, what we need to do on the given values as a list. I extracted this function to a outside function just to make the code a little bit cleaner and easier to read. So after we've computed the sub packets, the values of the sub packets, we can operate on those, do the operation as defined in the puzzle um, and then return as required when the next packet starts. And so at the end of all that, we have this function that takes in when a packet starts in the big string and it returns the value of that packet and when to start the next packet. So we can simply call that function on zero to say we want to start from the beginning of this whole thing, find its value. And then we have our answer. We just have the results of this huge packet. And the answer is quite large. So there's a lot of complexity going on here. But yeah, that's basically how I solved part two. So today's puzzles, again, are quite complicated, evidently, by the length of this explanation and just how much code there is in here. But hopefully you found today's puzzles fun as well and this explanation to be helpful. As usual, the code will be in the GitHub repository linked to in the description. And that's it for today's video. I want to thank you for watching, and I'll see you tomorrow for day 17.